Hello everyone, my name is Vlad Glavano. Um, I am um, Head of the Department of Psychology and Counseling at Webster University Geneva and Director of the Webster Center for Creativity and Innovation. Uh, I am trained as a psychologist and normally when, when psychologists approach the notion of creativity, they're very much interested by what's happening in the head, in the mind of the person. So you have a lot of individual explanations for why people create. My approach is sociocultural. So what I'm going to propose to you, you know, very briefly, is to think of creativity as a kind of a relationship, a relation to other people, to the world, rather than that something that happens inside the person. So I've, I've chosen the, the notion of dialogue because I think it captures very well this dynamic kind of co-evolution of how ideas, creative ideas come about, which is never only within the head, but in the relationship with our environment and the world. In psychology, as I mentioned, you see that creativity is many things, right? It is a personality trait in some ways or related to personality traits like openness to experience and so on. Um, it is very much a cognitive process, meaning that people focus a lot on how we mentally process information to come up with ideas, a bit less about how we feel or what we want at that moment. It is seen often as a gift, um, you know, as an aptitude or a skill or even as an attitude towards um, life and towards yourself. What's interesting is that uh, people also work with um, very much a product definition of creativity, meaning that when we try to study and understand uh, what is creative, we think about what is being produced and the qualities of what is being produced. So some of those qualities need to be, on the one hand, novelty and originality. So the thing being produced needs to be uh, new compared to what existed before, but also distant from it. Because you can create something new that is a, an exact replica of what existed before. So that, that would be new, but not um, original. And it also has to have a certain kind of value. Um, a lot of the, the hype around creativity nowadays comes from the fact that many people interpret the notion of value as ultimately economic value. You know, the big innovations, the big creations that change society and, and, and you know, make money as well and make an impact. But in psychology, it's good to remember that uh, things can have value if, if they're at a very micro level. So when a, a child is drawing, for instance, there is perhaps no economic value to that, but there is a lot of value in terms of development. So a lot of the creative things we do have value for ourselves. You know, they have meaning for us. When I started um, looking at what has been written about creativity about, uh, you know, about 10, 15 years ago, what emerged for me is, is that we have big clusters or ways of thinking about creativity. One of them is the he paradigm, the, then the I paradigm and the we paradigm. And each one has its specific definitions, ways of measuring creativity and implications. The, uh, the he paradigm. Okay, so the he paradigm is, is a very traditional, very old way of looking at creativity as the genius, right? So here we have associations with revolutionary creators and revolutionary society changing creations. It is one of these old images that we still carry around. And part of the reason why when you ask people in everyday life, well, are you creative? Many people shy away from saying, yes, I'm creative because they take as a reference point the genius, right? So why did I call it the he paradigm? This is not out of sexism, but actually is to, to show or to kind of highlight the ideological construction of who traditionally has, become, has been considered a genius in society. And this is male creativity that has been celebrated, right? So it's pointing to the fact that the, the category of genius is not just a natural, it's not a natural category. It is a, uh, the way society constructs whose creativity we celebrate and, and why, right? So the focus is, has, has often been traditionally on male geniuses, it has been on revolutionary creations, and also on this idea that very few people get to be creative at that level. So this paradigm is, uh, is very much exclusive in many ways, in the sense that you know, it is elitist. Only, only a few, a limited number of people get to be truly recognized as creators. And um, it also imposes a kind of a disconnect uh, between the creator and his or her society and environment and culture. Um, the image of Rodin uh, kind of symbolizes for me a lot of what the he paradigm shows, right? I mean, it's not only a man being there, you know, the thinker, but also this mental kind of intense process that often leads to something absolutely exceptional that, that changes, um, changes uh, society. 
in psychology, so from the 1950s onwards, we developed uh, a different discourse about creativity, a discourse that is much more inclusive and really concerns um, everyone. Every every person can be, uh, can be creative. Every person... Um, Every person has creative uh, creative potential, even if not everybody gets to indeed um, create something of value, you know, for society. So this way of looking at creativity, I call the I paradigm because it really is, is much more democratic, right? And and I think we all know that we live in a in an era, in a, an age where if you look at the way education is done, you know, people want to train creativity. They don't think of it necessarily as this gift that only a few individuals have. The problem with the, the I paradigm is that it still remains very individualistic. My, my chosen visual metaphor for this is uh, this culture of the cubicles, right? So you recognize that something is widespread. You recognize that many people you know, can participate within creativity. But the way we look at them very often in, in how we measure creativity and how we try to educate it is as separate separate individuals, right? Everyone has their, their, their little booth there. My work is dedicated to the last paradigm, really, which is the <laughs> we paradigm. And this is both a, a relatively new and, and an old way of looking at creativity, because what it does is to bring back the notion of context. Nobody creates, uh, creates completely alone. Nobody creates out of nothing or out of thin air, which is very much the he paradigm genius approach. So in the we paradigm, we focus on the creative person in context and we try to understand creativity not as something that happens in in the individual mind isolated from the world but something that explicitly happens in relations with objects with other people with spaces and places and institutions and culture um, so creativity becomes this collaborative interactive phenomenon we created based on the ideas of others you know based on ideas of people who are long dead and, and we kind of build upon so creativity becomes much more collaborative and much more dialogical so this is uh in portugal in belém and um, when I was doing my PhD, uh, when I came across this, uh, this um, it's actually a building, it's not, not even a sculpture, this building, I was really taken by it. And I think a lot of people are. For me, what was unique is in the way we tend to think of and celebrate creativity, we often, again, zoom in on individuals alone. We, we give a lot of prizes for individuals nowadays more prizes come up for collectives and, and people who collaborate. But we build sculptures and statues that celebrate individuals. This is one example that tries to put that person in context. Yeah, there is a creative achievement related to, you know, discovery and so on. But behind the creator, you have so many different people who kind of come and support, right? You have clergymen and you have soldiers and, and, and many other people there. They're all men, uh, I think, which is, again, a minus, but at least it's an attempt for me to try to reveal the hidden uh, networks of collaboration behind any creative act. When you interact with someone else, you have a, a surplus of knowledge there that you can tap into, including knowledge about yourself, right? If we always live within our isolated minds, we would never get to discover more about who we are, about other people. What we need to do is basically to be in dialogue. You know, creative understanding requires the perspective of another person on what we do, on how we think, um, and so on. So this idea that you know, you, we need to take the perspective of other people. We need to try to understand their perspective on us and the world. It's actually quite difficult to do that. This is not an easy thing to do. You know, we notice that in everyday interactions, when we try to understand even the closest people to us, we sometimes get surprised. We sometimes get to not fully grasp why do they think like that? Why do they, why, you know, why, why, do they, why do they say that? In order to understand another person, you have to understand them and their context together. So what I'm trying to say here is that, one, creativity depends on collaboration. Creativity depends on interacting with other people. How do we create, right? So let's take this idea of an object. The object can be anything. It can be a problem. It can be, um, it can be you know, um, ourselves. We can, we can take ourselves as an object of reflection. What's interesting is that 
at every moment we have different perspectives on this object right so if we take the example i don't know of of an umbrella right what is an umbrella the dominant perspective and and i, I try to depict that with the thick line the dominant perspective is that the umbrella is something that shelters us from the rain Actually, interestingly, if you live in other places, maybe in uh, Southeast Asia, uh, a lot of people use umbrellas to be sheltered from the sun. So already you have a second perspective there, you know, a cultural difference. But most of the times umbrellas are about kind of protecting yourself uh, from, from, you know, the, your environment, if you want. The interesting thing, and this is where the, the origin of creativity, the story of creativity begins, is that there will always be other perspectives to understand the umbrella. The umbrella is not only this object that shelters us from the rain. The umbrella can be many, many other things. You can you can plant uh, flowers, you know, if you turn it upside down, you can make a lamp out of it. There are so many other things that the the the, um, the umbrella could could be, if you want. We just need to open our minds towards them. Now, the question is, where do these other ideas and perspectives come from? So if you adopt, again, a very I paradigm or even he paradigm type of model, you're going to think that they come from your own mind. You know, it's because of the way I think, it's because of the combinations I make in my own mind. I combine two ideas, umbrella and, and flower pot and you know it emerges this new perspective emerges but in a we paradigm type of approach we actually come to recognize that these perspectives come from the fact that we belong to different groups of people we're part of different communities we interact with a lot of different people in our lives right so it's not only the family and then the school we go to it's also we interact online with people we see movies we have all this baggage of social experience that presents us with so many new perspectives. So instead of thinking of creativity just as this personal potential, individual ability, way of combining information in your own head, I propose that we should look at every act of creativity as a kind of, as a kind of dialogue, a dialogue of different perspectives. But because we grow up in societies and we get presented with all these perspectives of other people and our community and so on, very often these dialogues happen inside our heads, right? Think about uh, when, when, whenever we write something. We often have the audience present there with us. We write it, and, and often in a second, mo uh, second moment, we get to think, okay, but how would my, my employer see this? How would my colleagues read that? How would the audience react to that? You always have this back and forth movement within yourself that is very social and, and, and gets into this dialogue of different, of different perspectives. Uh, then what, you know, what, what drives people uh, and how do they uh, nourish their creative process? There were very interesting metaphors used by script writers. So, being like a hunter in the forest, you know, always being on the alert, always being on the lookout for something new, for a new perspective, a new idea, a new angle uh, of looking at things. And also, and this is really, I, I love this expression, that we are permanently nourished by the spectacle of the others. And what is this spectacle about? Again, it's this marveling at the fact that other people have different views and different perspectives from our own. I, I, to a great extent, our fascination with others comes from the fact that they can always surprise us and they can make us rethink what we thought we knew. So, and at the end, you know, the, every scenario, it's the fruit of collaboration. And, and I think with script writers, it's very easy to make this point because there are so many visible and clear links and collaborations that they, they, they have to engage in, you know, to produce something. But if you think about the work of a scientist who works maybe alone in the lab, you're never fully alone, but let's imagine someone who does more solitary creative work. You need to actually reflect more deeply about all the ways in which you, you collaborate and depend on other people for what you're doing, right? So this is a, a very good case that the script writing one, I think it fits very nicely, this idea that when we look at others, when we create and get inspired and, and uh, kind of create stories, what we try to do is to be nourished by their perspectives, you know, by the interactions with them. So finally, what can we do if we want to be more creative or open ourselves up um, as a script writers or as, as any other person? Well, the story I've been telling you, it's not only a story of dialogue, but at the end, it's a story of difference in many ways. Basically, the, the 
the three pieces of advice, if you want, I can give, and I, I hate these three-step models, and this is not one of them, and this is not a, a kind of how to do creativity, but if we think about it, the first, the first step of a creative process needs to be becoming aware of all these differences. And this is a very important and crucial step. As a scriptwriter, you have a training to become open to, to the, the unexpected and to other perspectives. But what happens on a daily basis is that very often we, we shut ourselves down towards difference because it is uncomfortable, because it, it makes us question something about who we are, or just because we don't have time and we don't have the motivation to get deeper into the fact that someone thinks about the world very differently than I do. The second step is valuing these differences and these different perspectives. And what happens in everyday life very often is that perspectives that are very different from our own, we tend to exclude. We're aware of them, but we either immediately, you know, kind of counter them or, or we, um, uh, we, we simply reject them, right? An important point is that valuing a perspective doesn't mean agreeing with a perspective. And finally, the, the last point would be, okay, we're aware of differences, we appreciate that they're meaningful and, and, and you know, they're interesting, but what do we do with them? So the very important practical question, and maybe this is what our dialogue today will be about, is how you deal with difference and how you make differences of perspective productive uh, for creativity. I understand that your that your field of research is creativity seen as a dialogical mm -hmm. process. Mm. But but my right. first question actually was that do you see it as an either or? Because I find mm. that I I, I really uh, I've been writing about this the dialogical process, uh, uh, right. but but I don't I don't necessarily. See, it's like when you talk about mm. the he, the he paradigm. It's very, right. um, like, it's something you don't like, you criticize it. The I dialogue mm. is better, <laughs> and the I paradigm <laughs> is better, and the we paradigm is the best. But is it an right. either or, or how do you see it? How do you right, see that? Right, excellent, excellent question, excellent question. Thank you, thank you for raising it, because you, you made me aware that I... I didn't put all my usual disclaimers, first of all, around these paradigms. And one of the disclaimers uh, I would have uh, put in was to say that I'm not trying to suggest a historical progression, first of all. You know, it seemed as if the he paradigm is a thing of the past, and then we got the I paradigm in the 50s, and then now we're kind of all basking in the we paradigm. That, that's certainly not the case. I'm sorry if I suggested one is necessarily better than the other, because I do, I can find ways to appreciate the he paradigm, well, may, maybe he, she paradigm if you want, um, in the idea that it gives us such clear cases of creative work that it's easier to isolate, you know, the phenomenon of creativity. Because in everyday life, creativity is mixed up with a lot of other things we do. So there is a value in looking at geniuses. We learn a lot. You know, we, we, we read biographies of geniuses and so on. What I have a problem with is the way we might portray, you know, what do we take from them? So when we have these kind of romantic, uh, because it is a romanticized view of what it means to be a genius that takes the person out of their context i think that's where it becomes a bit problematic you know because uh, yeah of all of that but definitely i don't i don't see them as opposing each other necessarily and i see them as intertwined very very much and um, you also started about the dialogical mind and it gave me an idea, sorry if I'm, I'm going on and on, but very often people take what I say as anti-individual. And actually what, I, what I'm trying to say is anti-individualistic thinking. So the unit of analysis should not be the individual alone. The individual is crucial there, the mind is crucial there, but the unit of analysis for me is interaction. So it's individual plus context, object, others, and so on. I, th I think just to follow up on that is that um, in filmmaking especially, there seem to be different periods of time when different notions of creativity are necessary. So, so for example, you, you might have a combination of writer, producer, director ag agreeing this is the vision. Uh, and mm -hmm. that vision is then given at different stages to different people. It seems to me perhaps that the real act of creativity is creating a space which is outside mm. other spaces where judgment is suspended. And that, right. that, and that then enables people to be 
I creative. Right, right. It's a very, I, I love this idea of the space because in a way the, the geometrical metaphor there with the different lines coming in is exactly the point about the space because if you have only a single point or a single line, you don't have a space, you have a, a bi-dimensional, you add space by adding perspective. So I, I completely agree with that. And I like this idea that different types of dialogues are different, are, are needed for different historical times or even different moments in the production of a film or a work of art and so on because i didn't i didn't truly really specify what happens in that dialogue um, it's not always about more voices better creativity we know that from our own experience mm -hmm. it's not always about more perspectives because they can be confusing or blocking so uh, absolutely yeah do you, do you think uh, where, what do you think fear has to play in in the in uh, fear and creativity and mm. f fear and creativity especially with these three different paradigms that, that you outline. Oh, I, I like this idea. Well, I, I will tell you where it takes me, this notion of fear. Um, I think what, what I'm trying to get at is this fear of other people that is very much embedded in a, in a certain way in which we see creators. As I mentioned just briefly before that, I think a lot of people have this view of conflict between creators and their time and their epoch and their society. Actually, there are theories of creativity that explicitly talk about um, the fact that you need to struggle against the society of your time to create, you know, to create great stuff. So there is a fear that other people and society are actually kind of strangling our creativity and making us less creative. What I'm trying to say is we need to overcome the fear of the other and try to welcome what the other offers us. And there are so many things they offer, you know, and, and, I, and I think, you know, overcoming this fear of otherness, especially radical otherness, what does it mean to meet someone who has a completely different worldview than mine? It kind of questions my own being, you know. Can I jump into this uh, conversation? Because I think that, that uh, I see it as there is a constant dialogue between creation and editing so you mm. create something and then you edit so like i this have right. this idea oh this was not a good idea so it can be and an, in a sense that's that interaction between the feedback uh, uh, action and feedback yeah. yeah for sure but 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 also the the when the editing takes place because i think um, w one of the things that can go wrong is that editing, uh, censorship, judgment, therefore, uh, comes into play way too early. Well, it depends on uh, how you see it. So it's also a psychological thing, I think, because you project things into... When I say it's judgment, it's already something centering. Or when you say centering, if I say yeah. feedback, it's like... You have action, and you always have a you, you always have a feedback because I mean, if you move, you the air comes again. You feel the air. Yeah. So if you don't have movement, you don't have dynamic. So part of dynamic is is feedback, but feedback doesn't have value attached to it in the same way as censorship. So so like I would say, right. I've, we have <laughs> talked about my collaboration with Lars von Trier, who had this who has an immediate censorship inside his own mind because, because he's so ambitious. So very ambitious people very often has this censorship inside themselves. No, this is not good enough. But that's, so that can be bad, but it can also be good because that, that's what makes you take it further. When is it good enough? Can we take it further? So, so, so my question about creativity and how you see it is, is the creativity is, is dialogue or feedback and action and feedback, mm. creation and feedback, is how much is it intertwined? How much can right, you separate right. it? I mean, there is actually a geography of positions in society. Think about like almost like mountaintops and valleys. People in a position of power, they impose their perspective. And I think that humiliation comes in when that power of the perspective says, not only if you don't think like me, you have a different perspective, but you are wrong. You are unethical, you are not good, you don't understand. And I think that happens often in dialogue. So just picking up on that, one way in which we can open more authentic dialogues is not to ignore or bracket power, because power is everywhere. Power is part of, of life, you know, it's just accepting and admitting it. But just creating that space to question 
um, you know, the, the disassociation between power and good and wrong and right, just creating that freedom. And, and often, you know, the way I do it with more practical exercises is by including a dose of playfulness. Playfulness has this amazing capacity to relax the norms for a moment. It has a lot of norms and that, that's actually good. I think we're going back to this idea of feedback and so on. But it also creates the space that failure is not seen as wrong, as a dead end, but it's seen as a continuation of what's going on. One of the interesting things I talk about perspective taking, and I, I, I didn't get to talk much about position, but a perspective is formed from a, from a position. You, you'll have a, either a physical position, right? If you have visual perspectives, now, now I look at the phone and I, I have a certain visual perspective, or you have a conceptual perspective from a certain position you have as a director, as a, you know, and these positions vary a lot. How do you take another perspective? You have to reposition yourself so this process you mentioned about you do something and then you add it your basic editing for me is a second position you always in creativity need to step back or reposition yourself to develop the new perspective sometimes you step back or you step into the position of someone else you, you try to think through their minds okay well that's how they would see it and so on so for me i think feedback is a completely integral part of that dialogue i wouldn't even call it a a um a second moment there is a theory of the self uh, by William James and other philosophers who talks about the I and the me and the fact that whatever I do, there is always my appreciation of what I do. So I'm doing and I'm observing myself doing at all moments in time. Sometimes I get very immersed in my doing and sometimes I get very reflective in my observation. But these are intertwined uh, very, very often. I think on the last point is, uh, I think everyone knows that the first stage to being a a film director or a writer or anything is to pretend you are that and to imagine yourself <laughs> as that. Right. And it's, it's a very early thing that you do. And once you get used to the idea of that's what you would like to be, you then become it, you know. If you write something and you've got it right, what happens when the first person reads it is that they tell you stuff you didn't know. They tell you, th they, mm. they respond to it and they tell you things that you didn't realise were in that, in that piece of writing. As I said, that always seems to be the best, the, the best time. And then the other part of that is sometimes if you show someone something you've made, whether it's a film or whether it's a piece of writing, you, you somehow can hear their perspective before they've said or done anything. Somehow the act of giving, mm. you immediately, especially mm. with a film, is mm. make it because it makes you so vulnerable mm. that when you, sh you show right. a film, you, you're, especially if it's an auditorium, you, you, st you stand at the back. You don't have to hear reactions. You know, what, you, you know what is working, what isn't working, and what was always working, what was always not working. So I, I'm not quite sure yeah. what that means, <laughs> but it's, it's like, so you want the perspective, but somehow you, mm. somehow you knew it before you have a response. You, you anticipate. Right? Mm. I, 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 see, I see what you mean. I think it, it talks back, at, at least for me, uh, of this social experience. You know, I talk about social experience uh, a little bit in my talk because for me, imagine as we move through life and we go through different positions and we exchange this position, it's a very dynamic thing. You know, we're multiply positioned at different times. Anyway, we play with these perspectives. You know, play comes in again and we accumulate them and we, we, we form this huge reservoir that we tap into. And I think a lot of that is an almost unconscious automatic way of tapping into the position of an audience towards what we say or what we do and I you know coming back to this idea of the simultaneity of, of, of doing and feedback when we talk we also listen and, and it's a very beautiful basic fact that whatever we do we immediately have an echo of what we do that comes back to us you know and, and then that echo reverberates within that baggage of social experience and then of course other people come in and they can disturb our interpretation of that we, we thought we knew what they would say but this is something completely different and, and what is that audience because because you know we were talking earlier about the audience is there is no audience in some ways, in that it's so right. diverse, it's a it's a it's a mixture of individuals, and uh, it's it's why it's it's difficult if um, uh, an if you're talked to by an executive who says, oh, who are your you know what is your audience here? 
That's 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 a very difficult thing to answer. I mean, I, I don't do sadly uh, anything as, as as creative as 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 you guys talk about. But when I write something, sometimes I can identify almost the voice of my supervisor. And I finished my PhD ten years ago, and I could I could know that these are ways that she would look at it, right? So we we identify. Sometimes it's much more, as you said, it comes almost from nowhere. So when you look at how children play, they sometimes take the perspective of their colleague or parent, and they say, "My mother wouldn't agree with that. My father would." want that, you want that, so they can always do that. But there comes a time when they say, you shouldn't do that, one doesn't do that, they understand the norm. Who says that? No one in particular, that's society. For him, that's the idea of the journalized other that we carry with us all the time. I don't know if this is useful, but it made me think of it. It, it, it is useful, it is useful because tied to that is shame. Because if you do the things that we don't do, then it's deeply shameful, which means you're outside the society. Ultimately, it's, the audience matters to a huge degree because the audience equals society, no? If you only have the he paradigm, or maybe the I paradigm, but basically the he paradigm, it's like I, that, that's how film industry was when I grew up with the auteurs. Like, I have this, I have this brilliant film in my head and it's all about having this brilliant thing, vision transported into screen. But unfortunately, there's a hostile environment on, on my way, you know, all the people money, all the Hollywood, all the conventions, it's all enemies. And in the end, but it's brilliant. But then when I see it and no one else, I'm the only one seeing it because no one wants to pay the ticket. Then I'm deeply dis disillusioned. So, so in the creative process, if you want to transform that kind of community or that kind of uh, industry or con concept of making art, then, uh, then we have to make safe spaces for dialogue. Mm -hmm. Because if, if we don't make safe spaces, then people just don't want to be in them. So it has to be safe, right. uh, attractive spaces for dialogue. Uh, what are your thoughts and reflections on how can we create a safe space, safe and attractive space and playful? Right. Creators, they, they fall roughly in two categories and actually one and the same person can, can use the two discourses at different moments in time. So there is that discourse of co-creation, ping pong, everything is collaborative, which I'm, I'm kind of obviously studying and I, I appreciate as, as, you know, tapping into something real, whatever, whatever that is. But there is also a discourse of creativity that says that, as exactly as you said, I need time and space to, cre to express myself. I actually need to run away from others. Others will be a distraction. Others will judge me, will block me. And you know what? Both are true. The other can be a facilitator or a distraction. I think the problem is, you know, I talked about the journalized other and we talk about the, the audience that has no face, is the public or whoever that is. I think we often operate with this view of society that makes it completely monolithical. It's, it's the, the big other, you know, it, Lacan talked about it anyways, this idea, psychoanalytically you think of the image of the father or whatever, authority, right? In reality, society is much more fragmented. And in that society, we have friends and collaborators and people who are in our corner. And, and how do we tap into those images of society to help us re-engage? Because often we just say, it's the power that comes at me, will judge me, will block me. Society is much more than that. So I think one thing to do is really to, to change the way we think about the social world. I think, by the way, social media and everything about connectivity nowadays has opened up some of those spaces. It is a bit controversial because social media can bring us many negative stuff, God knows. But but it does present you with the fact that there are so many communities and so many voices out there, you can always find solace and comfort in, in part of that. So I think one, one thing is to, to just realize that the social is more diverse. The second thing, it's exactly as you said about safe spaces and basically trust in a way and the trust in the other and the trust in yourself that you only build over time. And some people are fortunate enough to have had enough support that they develop what in psychology is called self-efficacy. Self-efficacy is this belief that you can do it. And, and and that belief does carry you through. And, and uh, the next time you meet a challenge, you can navigate it better. How do you do it, by the way? I'm going to ask questions as well. <laughs> how, how do you think of doing it? <laughs> well, I, uh, first of all, uh, uh, for me, it has to create a very, it has very much to do with transparency. So that's one thing, I think, because uh, 
because this has also to do with paranoia. Fear is linked to paranoia very easily. So in order to prevent paranoia, there has to be a transparency as to what situation we are in, as to the roles. Of course, com some people are very extrovert, mm -hmm. some people are very introvert, and we seem to, seem to have a lot of conventions as to have how dialogue should be. You know, uh, what is dialogue? How do we perform dialogue? Uh, so there are many, I think there are many, many levels and dimensions. There are so many things to be considered about. But I remember working with a friend of mine where we, we wrote a piece together and we, we hired a, a room and it had two beds and we would work together, then we would eat, then we would both go to sleep on the two beds and then we would wake up and do some more work. But the beds were absolutely part of the, of the act. But, but, I, but I find the... the, the um, I, I love this talk about creativity and working with people, and you're right, it's got to be fun and playful. But one of the big problems I have, and one of the things I'm trying to figure out now, is that the, uh, the, the structures that do things like fund, mm. um, commission, organise, make things possible, pay for, are, I find, sometimes so, so powerful and so uncreative and so unhelpful. And very often, mm. the people involved in those structures uh, seem to have no understanding or interest in the act of, of creating and how to do that right. properly. I think two things. One is I find them more and more powerful. Mm -hmm. um, and the mm -hmm. second, I think, uh, experience is a double-edged coin. And, you know, if right. you recognise what you're doing uh, too quickly or, or too, you're too familiar with it, you know you need to reinvent yourself somehow. So my, my personal interest at the moment is about reinvention and which is why I'm here and we'll have and I'm part of this conversation yeah. um, and when you talk about <clears throat> the the first paradigm mm. the genius paradigm I mean that is so supported by critics and mm. people who comment and write about what we do because they have a living out of it mm. it's in their interest it's not right. they can't make a very good interest uh, a good living out of having the we paradigm it's too amorphous no. for them. It's too <laughs> complex. They like to have one guy, Napoleon, there he is. He's, he's the one who, who is responsible for this. And then we can discuss that. Yeah. And then everyone picks up on that because it's, it has a simplicity to it. So. I, I completely agree. You know, the, the most dangerous part of the we paradigm is that if you take it to the extreme, because there are, of course, different shades and it's a continuum, then you would blow up the very notion of copyright in some ways. And a lot of the, the business is made up on this idea that you can recognize single authorship. Uh, just a quick note, because I was really intrigued by the, the beds in the office or moving around. Um, with this perspectival model, the idea of movement, you know, even if you move from here to there in the room, or if you walk, uh, walk outside, what do we do when we move? We physically change positions, and therefore we develop new perspectives. We see the scene, even if it's our environment, in a new way. And, and there is a parallel there between wandering around, wandering with an A, and mind wandering and wonder with an O, because that is the act of opening yourself up to new positions, right? You move around, you move your body, you need to move your mind as well. So what you're talking about, both of you, or especially now with the, the, the last part, was the institutional nature of the social. And we go back to the power and all, right? So we have perspectival dialogues, but some perspectives, the funders, the ones we depend on, they will have an absolute almost type of perspective. They, they almost work to exclude other views. If I say that should be, then, you know, whatever you say, it won't really matter or just it's just how it is. So in that, maybe we need to find the positions from which we can challenge the hegemony or the authority of that 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 perspective. I'm not saying it's easy. I don't know the answer. Maybe we need to create alternative festivals and things. And people have been doing that for a long time. But if we understand that a perspective becomes hegemonic and a dialogue turns into a monologue, then where are the other positions and the other resources we can use to, to challenge and destabilize that hegemony? In the UK, there used to be a department of experimental film mm. and the, the job of that department was to play 
with film? I think first of all, we need to realize that you know money doesn't grow on trees. So uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Apart from the tree I have in my oh, garden. Oh yes, that's special tree. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but but the thing is that uh, I'm a bit cynical about this part because, or maybe you know, I'm or maybe not cynical, but just you know, it's like yeah, it's a lot of money. Who who would give the money? I mean, so if you want to use someone's money, you have to convince them it's worth it. I mean, if not, you can use your own money or do some creative stuff that doesn't cost much money. But, uh, but, but the thing about testing out new things, I think actually here we have a paradigm change with our, in our industry because I was a head of, a, of an experimental called screen called New Danish Screen and that was exactly the Film Institute setting, and the television stations and cultural ministry setting up this scheme in order to have new perspectives and l to let that feed into into uh, uh, the traditional, more mainstream industry. So that was great. That's how it worked in the old days. Today, with the streaming and the whole explosion of media, what happens is that, that the development is so fast that uh, the, we see at night globally Squid Games or something. I didn't see Squid Games. But you know, something completely new, completely experimenting. And we as filmmakers get inspired. And next morning we go to our writer's room and say, ah, I saw something, this is great, we can do it. And you know, cut to two years later, it's on screen. But the audience saw it as well. And next day they adapted to that film language and they want more of that. So the, so the avant-garde is, is kind of in the audience as well, in the real audience, you know, in the spectators who pay for the streaming. So I think that uh, this gives a complete different kind of a dynamic in where is the avant-garde. So it's like when we went from mono to stereo, mm -hmm. when, when everybody got the stereo, no one wants the mono. Everybody, from one day to another, the, the rate of quality was demanded and, and new ways of, of recording music. So, so uh, and that's why I think that we also see more clever, big money stockholders, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, people who, ha who are in charge of power because of money, because they need all this new stuff. So they're more clear, right. they're, at least they are mean on a different level than they were before. But I don't see, but I, it's really exciting. To me, the audience is I the avant-garde. But I don't see much evidence looking at most television, doesn't look to no, me. No, but you don't have to look at most television. And no, that's no, kind of I a... don't see the evidence of that having infiltrated mainstream television. So, so you, you say the audience want to have a taste for this avant-garde, and, and I agree with you, I think mm. they do, but I don't see it being arriving on the TV set. No, but I, you know, that's because it will be in four years. Oh, four years. Because you need, you have kind of, you kind of have the, I'm, I'm, the, I'm, I'm the slow development and you have, but it's just what I'm, I think I'm just, what I'm trying to say that it's, it's the, the technology opens for a completely different speed of development than the old fashioned uh, way of producing film. And and that's uh, and and that's kind of that's kind of a change of what I would call a paradigm change, mm. and that so that calls for different ways of uh, power to act. Every every paradigm is a child of its era, and the the we paradigm is a child exactly of these rapid technological developments where connectivity becomes the norm, where it's almost impossible to claim I did it with myself in my own head, and I think it it really resonates with this fast pace, and I like this idea of how audiences became, um, they exploded in so many ways, right? They, they became so diversified and, and overpowering in, in some ways. And I think there is an interesting story there about what that does to creativity in film and outside of it. Could, I just, I, I'm quite interested to talk about empathy and right. um, uh, uh, being aware of difference. There's a story about um, Charles Dickens' uh, daughter, um, going into his study when he was writing and mm. being shocked because um, he used to physically become the, the character. I'm sure chemically your body is 
is changing because you inhabit, you, you do what you refer to as trying on the skin of, of, of people. Right. Do. So you, you do that. So there are two things. One is that mm -hmm. uh, is, is a, a problem at the moment because culturally, politically, I would not be allowed to be anything than what I appear to be, white, male, Mm. Middle class. Uh, middle aged middle class. Uh, middle class. All of these things. <laughs> middle, right. middle so, Europe. So that's the only thing I'm allowed to allowed to write about. Whereas of course right. I don't and <clears throat> couldn't and right. wouldn't want to. And part of the reason for writing is that I get mm. to try on different skins. But that's one thing. But the other thing is do you think I am truly inhabiting a character? Mm. Psychologically, we talk about three phenomena that are interlinked. Sympathy, uh, empathy, and perspective taking. So they, these are, uh, they're connected because they all want us to connect to the experience of another, but they're a bit different. So sympathy is when you have these physical, organic reactions to what is happening. So, um, <clears throat> excuse me, I have a bit of a cold. So for example, when, uh, when, when you see someone with their hand extended and some people go with the knife very quickly, you know, and they, they try not to get the fingers and do da 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 da, -da with the hand, we all have this reaction of pulling our own hands yeah. to ourselves. That is a sympathetic, organic tuning into the, the experience of the other. Perspective taking is a bit more cold because it's a bit more cognitive. You know, you can have great perspective taking abilities with little empathy. Serial, serial killers need to have amazing perspective taking abilities because they need to think where the victim would go, what would they do, where the, I mean, the, the great ones, whatever that means. But they have zero empathy because they don't want to experience the emotions of the person. So empathy is about inhabiting not only the thoughts, but the, the emotion of the person. So I think what we do with other people is we go through variations of these, you know, either more embodied, more emotional or more cognitive. And there are benefits and limitations to each one of them. So what I'm trying to say is that we need, we need an interplay. We need all of these processes together. And, and there's no one, one doing, doing the whole work. Did I answer your question? I don't think I did. <laughs> uh, uh, kind of, yeah. I think, I think, I think the, the idea of the interplay of these these three things, mm -hmm. I think, m makes makes sense. I mean, it's 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 a difficult it's difficult because the act of doing it is so different from describing it. Going back to that social experience, I think. You know, you said something very interesting, and this is what psychologists are struggling with. Can you ever get outside of your own mind? In some ways, no, because we are con confined to our perception and our, you know, we, we are confined in some ways. But on the other hand, life puts us in positions where the other person is. So maybe I don't know fully what it means to be a migrant, but I have been hungry. I have been lost. I have been scared. If I pull from myself this social experience, maybe I can paint a different picture. But that takes effort. It's not as easy as just using a stereotype and being like, "Oh, I got it." You know, yeah. I, th I think it's, it's it's interesting. I mean, if I can, it's, I can only refer to actual examples. But uh, right. um, it, I think it's connected with listening to people very often mm. and not acting immediately on it, but l listening. And somehow when people tell you their story, you, you, you are, in a very natural way, you're putting yourself into that story. You are imagining yourself because, you know, into, that, into their story they are telling you. Creativity, you said, is something that creates something novel, novelty and originality, something like that, is the definition of creativity. Right. <laughs> so, so I think that what we are also talking about now is creating something which we feel is authentic or true. When we talk about authenticity, it's an interesting concept because it is, you can never be authentic in the sense of reproducing an experience. That, that doesn't happen. Even for you, if you want to relive that experience, it won't be that experience. What we can be, but at the same time, we can be authentic in our quest to fully and, and more, more fully understand something. So perspectives will always interpret. And if you worry, okay, but I'm depicting something that is not maybe the real thing, imagine that when people see it, they also go into meaning making and create their own stories and they, it resonates with them differently. So it's always like a labyrinth of echoes and mirrors around that. But we shouldn't despair because it's not everything goes. It's not like I look at a movie and I create completely any meaning based of, of it and and this is where uh, the the weird thing about storytelling comes in that i mean that life is a mystery 
and the existence is a mystery and we can tell stories about it and there are kind of more stories in one person than stars in the sky in the universe. So it's like uh, there are so many stories and we can never capture them. Mm -hmm.